we are online. Okay. Um, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, and hopefully uh, not yet good night for uh, everybody in the audience. Um, I, do you know uh, how many people we have right now? Gilberto or Christine? Uh, 43. Okay, so thank you uh, for uh, all joining. We're gonna use the first uh, three minutes of the uh, webinar. Uh, we're trying to do a poll uh, everywhere survey to see where you're coming from. Um, I think um, somebody should put uh, how to participate in the uh, poll in the chat. And uh, we did some tests yesterday. The results were working. Uh, but it looks like today something changed. So uh, I might switch between windows uh, during the talk to show the results of the uh, poll. Um, so um, Stephen, Chris, did you put the yes. instructions? So instructions to participate in the poll are in the chat. Uh, and I, so you can, um, uh, I think it's, I'm not gonna say, you wanna say something, uh, Stephen? No, because um, I don't see the chat. I don't know what you put as instruction, um, but anyway. Okay, so we're starting. Do you see my screen um, with the numbers coming in? Okay, that's great. So I'm gonna switch back and forth between the two. So we are seeing uh, people joining from different places uh, in mostly uh, in the US and Canada so far. So I see Berkeley, um, mostly California, Oakland, Canada, Quebec. We have our friends from Quebec, bonjour. Uh, people from uh, Arkansas in Fayetteville, uh, Minnesota. Um, so the results appear dynamically using World Cloud, where the most frequent response are uh, in the middle uh, of the screen uh, and uh, the words uh, in the World Cloud. And uh, we'll keep the survey a little bit uh, to see who is coming. So people from Texas, Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, I believe it's Fort Collins in Colorado, the peninsula, thank you, San Francisco. Lincoln, Nebraska, good. Um, Minnesota, ooh, cold. Um, yeah, it keeps moving, Columbus, Ohio. That's good. Um, Shanatoga, is that Wisconsin? Let me see. Uh, and, uh, Louisiana, that's great. Corvallis, hello to our friends from um, Oregon State University. Guelph, of course, um, in Canada. Um, so I'm gonna, thank you. Um, I'm gonna move on. It's great to see our great participation and uh, a lot of uh, representation uh, from at least North America. I didn't see a lot of people from South America, although there's yeah, Bengaluru, I'm not sure where that is, but uh, anyway, thank you for joining. Um, so I'm gonna move the presentation along. So my name is Sebastian B. Rode. I'm a geophysicist at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Uh, I serve as Margaret Thorne Deputy uh, for the Ameriflux Management Project, and I lead the Ameriflux technical team. Bengaluru, I don't know where it is, Kaya. <laughs> yes. Um, I want to uh, welcome you to the fifth of a series of monthly hands on webinars hosted by the Ameriflux Management Program. Uh, the slide of the <laughs> webinar. Christine, do you mind trying to mute everybody else but us? Uh, the slide of the webinar will be shared on the Ameriflux website as well as a recording of this presentation. So the, the presentation is recorded. Um, the webinar is centered around a set of new concepts to scale the impact of the comprehensive site visit program that uh, has been the hallmark of the Ameriflux network since 1997 to maintain and enhance measurement quality and intercomparability between Ameriflux sites. The webinar is for Ameriflux uh, Tower team and anyone who wants to learn about the Ameriflux uh, approach to site visits. Our goal here is to present our current implementation of this new framework for site visits that we call the new implementation we call Site Visit 2.0 and get feedback on the new remote interaction component also known as Site Visit Lite. Uh, poof. So a little bit of logistics. Uh, the webinar will last about uh, an hour. Um, 
35 minutes for content and polls, 20 minutes for Q&A and feedbacks from you, uh, which should give us um, a few minutes to spare for transition and final thoughts. Uh, just a quick point on logistic. There is a chat window in the Zoom that the tech team and uh, will be moderating. So you can see messages for questions, comments, and Zoom help using this feature. Depending on the volume of questions, uh, we might have most of the replies in the chat. If we see questions worthy of a larger discussion or in general interest, we will probably save the question for the Q&A session uh, at the, the last 20 minutes of the webinar. Unmute the person asking the question and ask him to him, her to briefly introduce him herself uh, and ask the questions. Uh, we have prepared four live surveys for the audience. It looks like we had a little bit of a challenge at the beginning, so I'll switch uh, between uh, pages to get the results. You can email Christine Buchner at uh, AMP dash webinar at lbl.gov as shown on the bottom of the screen if you have uh, issues. So uh, first, um, I want to introduce the member of the AmeriFlux tech team. That's a slide you've probably seen a lot, but I, it's good to bring it back uh, over and over to make sure that uh, you know about the service that uh, you can get. So the AmeriFlux tech team uh, are here to serve the AmeriFlux community. Yes, Stephen Chan, Hao Sun Chu, and Sigrid Dangle are uh, pictured in the bottom right of the screen. You can reach all of us using the email address shown on the uh, bottom uh, below the pictures. The main goal of the technical team is to maintain and enhance data quality across the MIFLUX network. I want to remind you briefly uh, about the benefits of registering your site with MIFLUX. And um, main is access to free technical support. Briefly, as this is presented in detail in the past webinar, uh, you have access to, you had access to comprehensive site visits, not during COVID. Uh, you have access to learner instrument, calibrated power sensors, uh, year of methane loaners, CO2 and methane calibration gases, a portable profiling system, and a rapid response anticovariance system. Uh, the last September, we had a webinar on measurement best practices. Uh, you can see the uh, uh, chat section where we're just copying links uh, to uh, uh, the tech uh, team resource page on the MRFLOX webpage, which include a set of best practices checklist for field work activity and standard operating protocols from sister network, ICOS, NEON, uh, and WMO, uh, the World Meteorological Organization. Uh, the slide presented during the September webinar are also there, as well as a video uh, recording of the webinar. So one of the most uh, important function of the tech team has been is to maintain and enhance data quality across the MIFLUX network. Our primary approach has been to conduct comprehensive site visit with a portable AD covariance system that I refer to as PECS in the uh, next slides. The site visit identified and provide guidance on issue related to instrumentation, deployment, uh, calibration and processing. And we also advise on uh, measurement best practices, safety and other technical matters. Uh, the site visit also, I mean, that's a very important point, also serve as a vital conduit for exchange and interaction between the AmeriFlux management project and the AmeriFlux network as a whole. We typically deploy PEGs during the growing season for 10, uh, 14 days visits. Finding on data analysis and data processing are documented in a comprehensive, extensive site visit report. From start, you know, when we uh, uh, do the initial arrangement with the site PIs to finish when we uh, write our reports uh, documenting issues to the site PIs, one site visit takes about two to three, three to four months, let's say, of st staff time, uh, which is a lot. And if you want to know about this process, you can follow the link, again, provided in the chat uh, uh, to the... Um, tech site visit uh, link. Uh, and um, so now I I'm going to try to do yet another survey. Um, so um, the first, the second survey is, have you participated in any comprehensive site visit before? Uh, it is a multiple choice survey. You can choose one response, one response among the five options that we provided. So um, yes, more than once. Yes, once. Uh, you're not aware of the program. Um, no, but I am aware of the program, or no, I never heard of the program. And I'm going to switch to the response page, I guess. Uh, oh, that's going to be interesting. Let me do this. Uh, response page, have you participated here? Hopefully, that's going to go through. Okay, so we're seeing response uh, coming. Uh, Stephen, or somebody has put the information to participate in the chat, uh, again, in the uh, in the. So we're in the chat. Oh, and it's actually showed also on top of the page. 
So feel free to participate. Sebastian, I think you have to hit activate. I'm not seeing it show up. Okay, oops. There you go. Okay, now we should get a response. Thanks. So I'm going to let it go for about, you know, um, a minute or so. Um, I mean, the site visit program, uh, I want to mention since its inception in 1997, has covered about 200 and plus uh, uh, site visits. So, I mean, it's a very extensive program. So I'm not surprised that some people have uh, been uh, visited more than once, which is great. Um, A lot of people are not aware of the site visit program. So, which is, I mean, we, we'll 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 get those feedbacks later on. We'll ingest this because it's important that everybody knows about this. Uh, so, nobody has never heard. Everybody has heard. That's what I meant. Uh, is either aware I've been visited once or more than once, and nobody has heard about this, which is great. That means our communication is is sort of working. Um, so, I'm, it looks like the the poll has stabilized. Uh, here, my 4%. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, so I think we are stable. I'm going to move on. Thank you for participating. Um, it's great feedback. So I'm going to jump back to the next slide. So um, while the side-by-side -side -side measurements uh, form a critical benchmark exercise, you know, for uh, AmeriFlock, has proven its merits and received positive feedback from the community. The growth of the AmeriFlock network, 524 site registers as of today, 240 new sites uh, in the last five years, is making it very challenging for us to adequately assess the network at the current pace of eight to 10 site visits per year. So the figure on the right uh, illustrates the growth of the network, uh, the location of the site that we are visiting in the last four years, and the focus of the comprehensive site visit on North America. Uh, so to make it clear, the primary goal of the new site visit program is to scale up the benefit of the site visits and to be more inclusive. Okay. So what we, pro we, what we propose to do is to move from our current model of site visit shown on the left side of the slide um, to a distributed scalable framework. Oops, I went. Yes, this one first, uh, to a scalable framework for site visit and training on the right, right? We want to be on the right side uh, uh, of the slide. So in order to get there, we propose to implement a new framework for site visit program, dubbed uh, Site Visit 2.0. And again, this is a proposal to the community and we absolutely want to hear back from you on this plan, but also we want to hear back from you if you have other ideas, how we could scale up uh, this impact. Our plan, our plan is a three, pronged approach consisting of remote interaction between a tech team member and a site team that we call site visit light. That's that first uh, uh, A point. The second is a short duration, short duration in-person visit uh, between um, a tech team member or in a, in a site team, so in person. And the third one is a scaled down number of comprehensive site visits, extending engagement to regional site team and holding mini network. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the meat of the webinar and talk about uh, the site visit light approach. So this is a new concept that we uh, tested last year uh, at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, when we could not travel and conduct comprehensive site visits. Uh, it builds on our experience from the comprehensive site visit program, which found many cases where most uh, important site visit recommendations were data processing related. Light site visit does not include the deployment of a PEX system. It is rather a remote interaction between the tech team member and the site team. The site light visit will focus on evaluation of AD covariance data processing steps from the high frequency raw data to the 30 minute quality control data. And we will also document our findings and recommendation in a short uh, repaid, uh, report, typically two pages, one to two pages. Um, and if we want to compare the comprehensive, if we compare the comprehensive site visit uh, and uh, light program, the site visit light program has clear advantage in the scaling space uh, because uh, it, it's a much faster turnaround, right? One month versus three to four months. So again, um, next, uh, oh, uh, yeah, next survey. So uh, we want to know uh, 
what appeals to you uh, in the space of site visit. So whether you participated in a comprehensive site visit before or not, select the top two, top two valuable aspects for you or your team of a comprehensive site visit. So I'm gonna switch oh, uh, here. I'm gonna go activities uh, and whether you participate here and activate and so find and resolve issues at my site, whether the main uh, benefit instrument benchmarking, uh, B, C, data processing, benchmarking, consulting with the tech team, troubleshooting other issues, getting support on the, and I'm going to get flagged for this, in the infamous bottom. Uh, and we'll see if people know what bottom is. So I'm going to give you a few minutes uh, to get this uh, going. And uh, we, on purpose, um, you know, for instance, when we say find and resolve issues at my sites, uh, we didn't say through what mechanism, right? So we left it because we want to see what people actually think. Um, so um, I'm going to wait a little bit. for the uh, response to stabilize. Um, it's great to see active participation. Um, it's good. Okay, looks like uh, we're getting um, a good um, number of response and uh, steady state almost. Uh, which we like. Um, okay, I'm gonna move on. So most of the reports go find and resolve issues at my site, which is fairly generic, but I'm interested in the second one, which uh, actually is very reassuring for us because of course everybody wants to find issues at their site, but especially issues associated with data processing benchmarking, which is great, which sort of give us confidence in what we're trying to put in place. So thank you guys. Uh, so next slide is, so I want to tell you a little bit about uh, the site visit light process. So during the site visit, we want to focus our effort on two areas. The first is uh, bottom data, right? Bottom being biological and salary disturbance and metadata, everyone's favorite topic of conversation. Uh, we want to review the site general info that uh, you've submitted. Uh, we want to review and collect canopy height information in order to bottom that subgroup, uh, to publish that subgroup uh, of information. Uh, we want to review and collect the covariance instrument information, namely model height and separation between ERGA and SONIC for us to do that processing um, uh, benchmarking exercise. And uh, we also are collecting other information specific to the site visit light, uh, right? I mean, like the instrument separation and also on bottom information that is currently not published by the ML flux management project, but collected at site. For instance, disturbance, soil chemistry, biomass, and so on. And uh, to, to see what the network would like us to put effort uh, on. The second area, which is actually the main area, is the eddy covariance data processing. And as I said uh, before, our experience from comprehensive site visit found many cases where mo the most important site visit recommendation was associated with data processing. Um, so next slide. Uh, so this slide shows the current plan that we have for the site visit process. Uh, and I'm not going to go into detail, but step one, identify prospective sites. So that's on us. Then we initiate contact uh, for participation, participation uh, in that exercise. We gather information from the site team. So a lot of information to allow us to do that uh, uh, data processing analysis. We reviewed we do data review and analysis, which is the bulk of the work. And then we uh, share findings through a, a, another short report, uh, which is so mimicking what we've done with the comprehensive site visits. Uh, so, and now what we're gonna do is I'm gonna turn over the presentation to my site, uh, my tech team members, starting with Stephen Chen, will show you example of issue that we can diagnose remotely and we've diagnosed remotely. So Stephen, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Um, so as Sebastian said, we're gonna now just jump into some very concrete examples, looking at some data uh, to illustrate some of the issues and challenges that we see when working with site teams on data processing related issues. And as a caveat, just upfront, I'm gonna say that these aren't necessarily the most common or the most egregious, and we're certainly not trying to 
shame any site. Rather, these are just examples of the type of analyses and the, the depth and rigor uh, of the analysis that we perform. So just to get you a flavor of some of the things that we consider when doing a data processing review. Um, so, you know, the first example speaks to the raw data. And, and, and I bring this up because this is really our starting point for a data processing review. We want to start at the very kind of beginning of the, the collected data. So that's the raw, the five, the 10, the 20 hertz data and work our way and, and try to replicate the data processing done at the site uh, to the half hour hourly fluxes. Um, and, you know, the, really, I don't want to delve too much on the, the figures shown, but really the concepts that are presented. And the first is that it's really important on all data to visualize and, and to look at all of the data that's collected. And this is particularly important for the raw data because sometimes we, in our experience, we've seen issues that appear to be data processing related, but are really triggered by things that are hidden in, in the raw data. And so, you know, the first bullet point, when I say plot all the data, that means every column not only the columns that we use for our, our eddy covariance flux calculations, but everything that's collected, because sometimes things will be vis uh, visible in one, but maybe not another. Um, the second bullet point really speaks to considering all the different time scales, um, because plotting raw data, well, it, it's very simple in principle, it's very complex in practice due to the volume of data. So really considering um, looking at different periods of data, because sometimes things visible in one uh, time scale may not be seen in another. And then lastly, this idea of uh, checking the timestamps and doing maybe what I call timestamp math, something like using a time delta function in, in Python's date time library, really making sure that the resolution of the data that we're collecting is, is correct. And so these are just some examples of some of the things we will consider when we uh, work with a site team to review uh, the raw data uh, the data processing and starting with the raw data. Um, so next slide, please. Great. So the next example speaks to uh, temporal lags. And there's a lot of different temporal lags that we might experience or a, a site team might face in collecting data. Certainly data logger drift would be one of one example. But in this slide, I'm really focusing uh, on the temporal misalignment between the eddy covariance instruments. So that would be a sonic anemometer and a gas analyzer particularly when they are separate instruments. Um, and it's really beyond the scope of this discussion to describe when and why we might see these type of lags. But suffice it to say, it's, import it's an important data processing step to align those signals prior to calculating our covariances and our fluxes because incorrect lags will lead to um, erroneous fluxes. And you know, a lot of eddy covariance data processing software packages take care of all this for a user. Um, and Sometimes these intermediate steps before the final fluxes uh, are overlooked or just taken for granted. And this is something we really try to spend a lot of time on in our data processing review is to look at all the steps that come before the final fluxes. And, and the lag determination is a really important one. Um, so things that we would consider are making sure that the lags are consistent, they're realistic, they're, they're physically plausible, and then lastly, that they're optimized. And certainly if we see issues, you know, so this example, there's a histogram of some lags for water vapor from a closed path analyzer. You know, if we see some issues, maybe some of these high uh, counts towards the end of the search window, we have tools that we can look more in depth and to help um, shed light on why some of those lags are being used or and, and the impacts they may have. So with that, uh, I'll pass it on to the third example to Sigurd Dengel. Thank you. Yes, as Stephen has just mentioned, uh, using the wrong lag times can result in incorrect fluxes. So here I'm going to show you a concrete example from a methane data set we had received from a site. So in this case, the site has uh, used the default values for lag times in Edipro, as you can see in the upper right figure in blue. You can see the lag windows in this case was very, very, very narrow. They resulted in pretty good uh, methane fluxes, as you can see on the right lower <clears throat> figure, but um, which always at first sight, they look super. But when looking at the ensemble average uh, cost spectra, the figure on the left, we saw that the cost spectra did not follow the expected um, curve, showing that there were some issues with the fluxes. In this case, obviously uh, some flux loss. 
um, one of the reasons can like can be the lag time. So what we did, we extended the lag window to five uh, seconds in this case. And we saw that not only the lag, uh, the windows, the window use was uh, too narrow, but also an issue with the synchronization of the acquisition um, system. And um, once we corrected the lag time, we obviously received a correct uh, ensemble uh, average cost spectra marked in red on the left, uh, <clears throat> in the left figure, which of course also had a dramatic effect on the final mass influxes, as you can see on the lower right figure. And I would kind of recommend to people to occasionally check the cost spectra and spectra as those are implemented in the spectral correction and not to simply rely on default values given by various processing softwares. So it, it's always recommended to increase the lag windows, see are the uh, default values appropriate or not and um, see what the effect they have on the <clears throat> on their final fluxes. So, um, thank you. So, um, this is Hausen from the Amerifax team. I'm taking over. So, the last example we are showing here, I just want to get a quick review. So, one of the one of the steps we do during the uh, data review is we take the high frequency data and we uh, take a note from the site team about what correction or what uh, step they are using to calculate their flux data. And we try to replicate this process and make sure we can we can do pretty much the same thing. And during this process, what's interesting is we can find out, okay, is, is all the correction and setup being done correctly or uh, as expected? Because uh, a lot of time and people set up the code and to run their site's data, a couple of years later, some new student come and maybe don't understand what's uh, going on in there and just do whatever they want to do. So it's always good practice to remind ourselves what's being done in the process. And also most important thing is about uh, are these correction being done correctly? And also how sensitive to, how sensitive are these final flux to the uh, the choice we have right now? So this just here, just an example about, okay, if you say you apply a spectrum correction to your missing flux data or not, and the difference could be up to 10%. And if you miss this step, it could be a huge difference in your final flux. So next slide. So, um, uh, so we mentioned, so we launched the site visit line last year. Um, so we do have a, a, a four site participating in this uh, uh, last year. Uh, we're very happy to see them join the meeting today and they want to share their experience and what's good about this site visit process and also what could be improved in the future. So um, I'll start from the left. So our first uh, site would be uh, Steve Kallenberg uh, from University of Utah. So who is the PI of the CEDA Mesa site in the Utah. So I, uh, Steve, if you want to take over, uh, maybe just a, a minute of your comment. We appreciate it. Steve. Cool. Yeah, thanks. Um, so it was definitely kind of fun and really, really useful to be uh, one, of the, one of the guinea pigs for this process, I think early on in the pandemic here and as this site visit light process kind of got going here. Um, just, I guess, briefly, my experience, um, I'm not sure how the process has changed or been iterated on since, but, um, you know, as, as um, everyone mentioned earlier, just filling out a lot of kind of metadata and other site characteristics, um, uh, just kind of in Google Drive, filling out different, the different instruments that you have, kind of um, different ways you chose to process the information, and then I ended up sending in uh, one month of high frequency data um, and all of the associated processed fluxes and the meteorological data from that one month period. Um, and then I just got a tremendous wealth of information back looking at um, kind of all of these different diagnostic plots and things. And it, uh, you know, the, the process um, from that respect was really, really useful because it identified a couple, you know, small little issues that I hadn't yet noticed on my end. There was like a, a calibration coefficient error. There was like a duplicated variable. Um, a couple of these uh, small things that probably would have you know, taken a little bit longer to identify myself. Um, 
And I think just to end here from, from my perspective, this was uh, We might have lost uh, Steve. So I, I suggest that we move on to Gil. Yeah, so yeah, so next will be Gil Bohr from uh, Ohio State University. So who is a PI of the Old Woman Creek site here. Gil, take over. Hi. So yeah, I, I'm really curious if the, so we found some serious lag issues, which we didn't know of, and I didn't dive into it yet. We just got the, conclusions a few days ago. So I'm really curious if what uh, Christine showed is my site or not, but we, we found other small problems. So some problems we kind of realized as we were working on preparing the data for the review, like we have two different sets of instruments on two nearby towers and we had the time shift between the time steps of those towers. So it was a good thing to find. I was very nervous about the keep and zone and it literally fell into the water in the winter and was in the water for two months. And shockingly it's working and nobody complained about its calibration. So keep and zone and is really good stuff. Uh, we figured out a few other small problems. We were missing parts of the bottom. For example, the orientation of the sonic was not registered in the bottom, which was important especially because there's a lot of footprint issues in the site. So we added that and we're still working on kind of fixing the data. We'll probably end up reanalyzing 2019 and 2020 after the implementing the conclusions of the site visit. Thank you, Gil. I hope you, uh, the process is very helpful to you guys. Yes, it does, it is. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll have uh, Gabriel Gosling, uh, who is from the University of Montreal, Canada. So, uh, who is the uh, data manager of the Scotty Creek uh, from the Northwestern Territory in Canada. So, Gabriel, to take over. Hello, everyone. Uh, okay, so uh, first, we submitted around one month's worth of data. Uh, Scotty Creek, well, the, that particular system in Scotty Creek is part of a nested system and it's really remote. It has several power issues a year because there's no sun and uh, we've had several instrument failures with so different instrument switches. So it kind of complicated things for data processing and we hadn't really looked at the data for a couple of years, actually used it properly. So this was a great opportunity to, um, to, to look deeper into our processing and whether the data was good or not. So uh, it, quite frankly, um, so it, it's been a great experience. We've uh, we've identified already a couple of problems with the, the, the processing and it's really sped up uh, quality control uh, and really uh, and really made us reevaluate some of the processing steps that we were just using out of, def out of default for a while. So it's, it's forced me to reevaluate how I would process, reprocess the data. So as far as how we deal with vegetation height and things like that. Um, and, and we're still in the process uh, of, of looking through the data with the SIGRID. We, like, we actually have a meeting next uh, Monday about it. So um, yeah, all in all, really good experience. And I recommend it for, to anyone who wants to participate. Thank you, Gabriel. So the last one, we have the Shannon Brown, uh, who is from uh, University of Gulf, uh, Canada. So she's the data manager of the Alora Research Station in, in Ontario. So Shannon, do you take over? Uh, yeah, so just to yeah, echo the previous um, site light um, user's experience, it was very easy to do. Um, yeah, we submitted the high frequency data along with what we normally be um, processing with EDIPRO. Um, uh, we don't have the results yet because we were slow at uh, responding, uh, not a fault of the site light process, just yeah, us getting backed up with things. But uh, yeah, it'd be a really relief to, um, to see, well, maybe to see how well what we're doing right now, um, like how well it's working. Um, we do have older instrumentation at that site. So I think the serial number is like 40 or something for the LICOR that's out there. So 
Um, it's uh, yeah, so having a bit of reassurance that we're still getting good measurements from this site would be is yeah we're looking forward looking forward to that. But, but yeah, but overall again a great experience. Yeah, thank you, Shannon. Uh, it's also slow on our side too. We are learning about how to do this. This is a new model, um, so new to all of us. Uh, so um, thank you for everyone's feedback and uh, their share their experience. And if everyone interested in a site visit live, then if you have a question about your data processing or you want another set of eye on your data, uh, we'll be willing to, to do so. So feel free to contact us. Uh, before we jump to a q and A, I I want to spend a couple of minutes uh, next slide. So let's come back to a couple of different concepts that uh, Sebastian men mentioned earlier about the uh, new model. So we talk about the site visit line, the remote interaction part, and how about the other two? So the second part is what we call show duration site visit. So the idea is we have a, a trained person, so it could be an M team, data team, or maybe tech team, uh, potentially can open up to an idea about could be a local peer from your region or maybe an ambassador from a certain region maybe if in the future and this trained person could go to your site and maybe provide feedback and discuss with your site team about um, instrumentation best practice maybe data processing and also other things and because of the, we don't, we don't bring a whole suite of the pack. So it's, uh, we can actually do the site visit uh, across a cluster of a site in the region. We can visit multiple sites. And the outcome could be uh, very similar. Try to write a show report summary about what we find, what potentially could be done better in the future. So this is the second concept. Uh, next one. So the third concept would be try to continue and also upgrade uh, what we've done in the past about the comprehensive site visit, right? So we bring a pack system and conduct a, a two weeks of the side-by-side -side comparison. Uh, because we are there, so we might just uh, use our time well. We can also try to bring, uh, try to work with the site team maybe to host a, what we call a mini workshop, uh, maybe one day or half day. And the idea of the mini workshop is that this could be expand and also invited people from the, from the region. So other site team, they want, may want to see the site visit, uh, the, the side by side comparison, or maybe they want to have a chance to talk to other peer. And we can use this mini workshop as a, as, as a channel to do so. So people can share the idea about their implementation, and it's real to see uh, two systems set up side by side. So we have a lot of opportunity to discuss about this. And the data processing I mentioned a couple of times earlier. And also some other thing we can also talk through this uh, mini workshop. And potentially we can even decouple the mini workshop from the comprehensive site visit if necessary. So for example, we see a lot of site joining Mariflux uh, from Central South America. So it might be challenging. Uh, try to bring the host with a pack to to set up a, the visit there but of course we can try to do a mini workshop then try to bring out a uh, peer and try to bring out share our idea together um, next slide so ultimately go uh, of this new idea is that we've seen the growth of the reflux in the last five years and we've been brainstorming about how can we reach out to more people right that's the idea we want to serve so we hope by bringing this new model, we can be able to reach more of the network and also strengthen the, uh, the community of the Ameriflux. And also uh, most important thing for me is that we can take this chance to foster our, uh, foster our peer for mentoring each other because ultimately Ameriflux is a network of people and not just a network of sci. Right, so we the important thing is about these people. They share the idea. They help each other, and uh, hopefully we can also empower the regional ambassador in the future to help uh, uh, the the network initiative. So, uh, with that, we do have a one last survey, um, so people can fill in while we open the floor for Q and A. So, last question will be, okay, we mentioned the idea about some new concept of the site visit, right? So site visit like remote interaction and also the other previous uh, site visit and also the mini, mini workshop. So which of the following would be most appealing to you? Uh, 
And while you're filling the survey, we'll open the floor for Q&A. So feel free to type in the chat or maybe just unmute yourself. And I think, Christine, um, if you want, you can start unmuting everybody. Because we're going to go into the, as Hassan said, uh, into the Q&A. Um, section of the webinar. Okay, so I, I think we have steady state, right? It looks like uh, everybody responded. So it's, um, um, and Hassan, I mean, everybody, um, I, I don't see everybody unmuted. So um, I don't know if you guys, uh, yeah, there might be background noise, like there's work construction in, in the background for me, but um, so it's good. Um, so remember, we just presented you concept, right? It's not set in stone. We really, really want feedback from the community because again, we are here to serve the community, right? I mean, all we do, all we implement is to help the site improve that, uh, improve that quality across the network. So, uh, so it's good to see that the site visit light is well received so far. So that's, that's really good. Um, of course, the in-person site visit is, has been a valuable tool uh, I mean, forever, because nothing replaced benchmarking, you know, putting two instruments side by side if you want to see if your instrument is working. So that's, the, that, that's one of the main advantages. Whereas right now, we, we see issues. When we see issues, um, we don't know if the instrument is working well, right? We, it might be uh, off uh, by a little bit, uh, but not crazy off. So the benchmarking exercise uh, really addressed those questions, because all the instruments that we bring when we do a side-by-side -side comparison uh, exercise are very well characterized, very well calibrated, very well maintained. Uh, they've been you know, sent back to the factory on a regular basis, blah, blah, blah. Things that are difficult to do at a site. Um, the mini workshop idea is very uh, uh, good for us because we're we're, we, we need to be more inclusive in our approach, right? I mean, as uh, the map I showed um, uh, previously is most of the effort has been done in North America in the lower 48, if you look at uh, that. We've put a few more site visit in Alaska and Canada in the last few years, but it's still mostly um, focused on, um, on uh, Northern America. So, and we'd like to expand this. Uh, so um, I think we're good. I'm gonna go back to the slide, Hassan, uh, yes. for this and open the floor to Q&A. So meaning we wanna have you know, live feedbacks from you. It's the first time we present this. Uh, revamped. So we have about uh, 15 minutes. Um, we've been, I've been a little bit long on the first part, but uh, let's open the floor and, uh, and um, you know, ask questions about the process, what you see as a potential issue. If you have new ideas, please jump in. And I'm going to not talk. It might be crickets for a little bit, but please go ahead. Hello. We do have, yeah, we do have a couple more questions coming. Uh, So, hey, this is Roswell Bradshaw from Florida. Hello, Roswell. Um, this is great, um, fantastic. Um, based on the uh, site visits and um, QA, QC and all that stuff, um, I like the idea of having, you know, the light visit, the mini workshop and also a regional ambassador. That, will really help gathering more people. And if you have a regional ambassador, like for the Southeast or the Southwest, that person can reach sites in a shorter time. And if that person is completely trained to solve problems or so to help in the whole process of doing Q, um, visiting the sites or doing um, the best, management practices and helping on data processing and organization and even submitting data to Ameriflux, um, that will help and that will improve the data, the amount of data and uh, will help keeping these sites running properly. 
I think that that would be a really, really great idea, including the regional ambassador. So uh, absolutely, um, um, Roosevelt. I mean, that's the first time the network hears about that concept of regional uh, ambassador, right? That's something we are thinking about. We are trying to empower the network to take charge, a little bit of charge of the data quality across the network. So we, it's a concept idea we have. We haven't you know, fully decided or get enough feedback to see what we want. We have multiple ideas and I can mention just a few. We've tried a few things. Um, and as Roosevelt described, we tried a few things. One being in the uh, Florida, uh, southwest uh, of the, southeast of the US, uh, where we had um, somebody going to sites, as Roosevelt described, and get some more information, do some visual assessments. And I think it helped tremendously grow, grow the number of sites from that particular region. And that was very, very valuable uh, to the network and, and to the site peers as well. So that's that's one. What also we'd like, we, we are potentially considering is um, for specific network, maybe uh, um, embed, um, people from maybe you know south america brazil central america with the uh, tech team when we do site visit when we're at the lab for a few time and provide you know guidance and training on how to do this and then when they go back to their region they can actually start implementing some of the uh, checks that we have uh, coordinated with us and that's what we call ambassador we also have a few site pis uh, that reach out to us and say Yes, we'd like to participate in that exercise. Uh, help us put that together. So, but we want to have feedbacks from you guys. So there's multiple ways we could do this. I see John Frank has his hand up. Uh, John, take it away. Yeah, I, I like the calling it a regional ambassador because I remember we we chatted about this concept when we met in Berkeley like a year and a half ago, and I think calling it a regional ambassador is a great name. Um, and I I like the idea because um, it kind of takes the burden sometimes off of of, of your group um, because there's a lot of expertise around. And one thing I don't need to put the neon guys on the spot, but it's like wow, you know, one of the things I think of is we have literally now that neon is the Mariflux site, you know, uh, we have neon people that go to sites all around the country and in the, in the, in the continent. Um, I wonder if that'd be a starting point to see if you know, Dave and the company would be willing to uh, you know, say, would, would they be uh, will, willing? And I think it'd be good to have kind of a list of different people in the different regions and specialties. Uh, and I would certainly be willing to participate in some form, but uh, I, I definitely want to second that opinion because I thought that was a really cool idea when we mentioned it previous. So I, Beyond that, I don't have anything else to add at the moment. It's definitely in the brainstorming phase, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad that you are, I didn't want to put Neon on the spot. So that's glad, I'm glad that you're doing it. So David, if you want to <laughs> mention something, that's great. Uh. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I, I, I think we touched on this a little bit in some of our preliminary talks about having a, a site visit at a, at a Neon site um, and thinking of ways that we could potentially incorporate our distributed field scientists um, that are, you know, maintaining towers or around the, the US. Um, uh, so I, yeah, I definitely think uh, there's that potential and I'd like to see that come to fruition. Uh, I think we, some discussion needs to be had on what that might look like, yeah. Yeah, and, and, um, and I don't know if uh, anybody, everybody knows this, but uh, uh, Neon registered 47 and sites uh, within yeah, Ameriflux. So. So that's, that's a significant, significant amount of work that could be done across the on sites. That would be great. But I'd love to hear about we, from other uh, people. Um, Asko, I see that you unmuted. Yes, uh, uh, this is Asko. Uh, I, I like the idea of ambassadors and the site visit light. I can see how this could yeah, identify many, many problems that might occur. Uh, but I would also like to point out that uh, perhaps why we have such a positive view of the effectiveness of site visits is to a very large extent because of the effectiveness of the team in your office. It, it is, I have gone through a couple different site visits and they have not all been of equal value and uh, sort of keeping the standards at, at the level that you have 
I, I think this is what makes it truly helpful. And, and this is not the minor factor. I, I'd say this is a huge part of, of why it helps. And ASCO doesn't own stock in the Ameriflux management project. Uh, so. <laughs> from your high performance. <laughs> well, thank you. Anybody else? Um, I didn't see if Chad was on the list of attendees. Sebastian, I had a question. This is Joy D. Paracharji from Monroe, Louisiana. Hello. Yeah, so, uh, so my question is, uh, in the past, I've had the privilege of having ASCO and Ben Runkle come over to my tower and uh, take a look. So with the regional ambassador program, is this going to be a little more involved where they'll be coming and actually working alongside, looking at data and stuff like that? Um, yeah, I mean, all of the above them. Um, I think we've tried to schedule something to visit your site as well at some point, but uh, the, the logistics are very, well, very, very challenging. Right. Uh, but I think that would work really well uh, for the site visit light process as well. One of the, um, I, and again, we are thinking about this, but I'm gonna say this, it might not be exactly right. So please correct me, Stephen Sigrid and Housen. One of the requirement we have is we wanna see data submitted to Ameriflux, right? And I think uh, it's important that we, because we've been sort of um, uh, visiting sites sometimes in the past, in the last five years, and we've never seen any data after that. So we've putting such an investment in these efforts that we really want people to be good players uh, in the community and really, really, you know, we're doing this to serve the entire community and not helping one PI getting his, uh, his sites uh, well vested for himself and not uh, for the rest of the community. So it's a community effort. Uh, but yes, as soon as sites share data, it doesn't have to be published. Should, should meet data with, uh, uh, is that Flux? Then, yeah, I mean, we are, we will, we could initiate any of those process. Um, so I'd visit light in particular. Some people have decided to pull off, <laughs> to put uh, off the site visit, the comprehensive site visits um, and not ask for site visit light because they think, you know, it's true. I mean, there's only four of us, right? If we do a site visit light now, you're probably not going to visit, do a comprehensive site visit at my site anytime soon because it's such an investment, right? So, and we need to spread across the network. So it's a balancing act. So I had a, a question um, thinking about all of the sites, the distributed sites and how we can make uh, remote site visits um, helpful. I, the, we've started, you know, building this kind of dashboard to view data and, and try to make sure that we have good data across the observatory. Um, I wonder if potentially getting buy-in from, say, starting with Ameriflux core sites and kind of building a dashboard where we could monitor data remotely across the Ameriflux network would be something, uh, I don't know, just an idea. But. Yeah, no, I think that's a great idea. I wanna say everybody should have their eyes on their data always. I mean, uh, and there's multiple tools out there that people have put together to check that what's, you know, you're getting not only, not the calculated flux, obviously, but that what you're collecting is actually first working, collecting data, sharing, and it makes sense. The problem, so I think you can do a dashboard integrated across uh, sub network like Neon because they're all Neon sites, right? But we have to keep in mind that the Ameriflux network is a coalition of PIs. PIs are responsible for their site and that's their site first. So we can offer tools, but we cannot mm -hmm. do the, uh, unless people reach out to us and say, oh yeah, please um, try to have uh, that visualization tool for our sites that you can use, blah, blah, blah. There's also communication issues. Not all the sites have good communication at their sites and a lot of sites you know, go there every two, weeks to a month to collect, retrieve uh, cards, data cards, you know, to get that data on, so which a little bit complicated. But we, are will, we want to help. Uh, we've done a few, um, a few presentation uh, in the past about, from site team that presented the tool they use for uh, dashboard at their specific sites. But yes, I mean, it'd be nice to hear back. So 
I talk too much, I'm not going to fill the blanks. So that's something I wonder about for for Neon sites in particular too, if the community has an interest in like seeing some of our dashboards. Um, you, you know, we provide the data, but is a visualization framework something that the community wants or they just want to grab the data, you know, and do their own processing with it, how they, how they see fit. <clears throat> I mean, it'd be nice to hear from the, we have a lot of site teams here, so. Hey, Sebastian, this is Joe from Berkeley. Um, responding to the last comment, I think the, uh, something in our lab that's super important is visualization and, and, you know, a big pile of numbers is just a big pile of numbers unless you can actually see it and, and understand what it means. And I think that's something that's really lacking in the network in general is that even even downloading data that's already archived on Ameriflux, I can't see it unless I download it and look at it um, and plot it myself. And having standardized tools out there that would let us see all this stuff in a browser, which you know doesn't require you having any special software on your local machine, is I think is a really good goal to pursue, both for raw and for the process stuff. So I think you know I think I should I would as on top of my list of things to see. I totally agree with that. I cannot put on the text for George. If you know Gita Laslop has the tool in Max Planck long ago where you can upload your data and get your flux, I think taking that a step further, some online tool where you can upload your data and then it will do your, you do the plot and kind of give some automated comments, but we let you see what you're looking there. And that was my, uh, I had two questions there in the chat. That was one of my questions. Something very similar already exists. It's not exactly what you want, the flux suite, but it's very close. So it may not be that difficult to modify it. So, and give it to you guys so that you can very quickly do this uh, light visits. Yeah, but we need to know when this concept develops, and I love this concept, this uh, site visit 2.0, but I'm looking at the numbers of sites and the growth of sites, and I can see that it's going to be primarily uh, the light visits. There is no budget anywhere to do the hard visits with so many sites. So then if we're talking about light visits, there could be the way that we can uh, give it to the core team, the Flux suite, and they can connect to people who already have smart Fluxes, and then they say like, okay, I like this part, but I need that one modified. And, uh, oh, this doesn't work. And I want to see two different sides on one plot, this kind of stuff. If we can do that, uh, and it will take us as usual, like it takes very long to do any changes. So while you're developing the concept, maybe we can also work together and you can tell us what you want. And uh, then we know it very early and can, and can start implement what we can. Thank you, um, George. Uh, I want to, that's really good uh, um, feedback also. Uh, I just uh, shared my screen again because we have one minute uh, before the hour. I mean, uh, this was a, we're almost out of time, right? So just a few key things before we wrap up this uh, uh, discussion, which is very promising to me. So if we would love to hear back from you and we've put, and maybe somebody can put that in the chat again, uh, links to uh, email addresses where you can contact us both uh, all uh, the tech team, the data uh, team, uh, and also if you want to get involved so uh, in this process and give us more feedback. So uh, thank you uh, for a great webinar. I think it was very, uh, hopefully it was useful to helpful and useful to the community. Thank you for joining all. And uh, uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks for our next uh, seminar, um, webinar. Uh, thank you all for joining and um, have a great uh, end of your week. Thanks, everyone.